So I constructed my piece by recording my own voice as well as using things like that I found on YouTube or like Shakespeare soliloquies are in there quite a lot. And, you know, I used Microsoft Word's read aloud function for if you, you can hear quite a lot of robotic sounding voices, that's all just read aloud. Um, just to kind of create this ominous discussion almost. It's not like any of the voices are directly responding to each other, but it, it is, you know, overlapping and creating a sense of how your mind works, how my mind works. Um, well, I just used GarageBand for it because GarageBand works really well for all that I need for it. I just needed the audio pieces and I used some like looping music and breathing in it. So that was really, I just needed that basic system. And so that worked really well. And on GarageBand, you can shift the, you know, side that the noise is coming out of from either headphone. I love listening to it. It really feels like someone's chatting on one side of my head and the other person's like chatting on the other side of my head. And it's oh, that's great. A dynamic experience. It just reminds me of like old Led Zeppelin, just hearing about it is like essentially how they would fade things from left to right to allow you to sort of get this atmospheric. So I can kind of feel that, which then is like, I, I'm just hearing it like a thought almost going through your head in a way. Exactly what I was going for, so. Wow. I'm curious too about um, how you intend people to hear it because with the headphones, the breathing really feels like it's your own breathing. Like I had that sense of, this is a familiar sound to me, that not quite panic breathing, but the, the breathing that I'm aware of, that's a little bit faster. And I think it's different when it's headphones, it's, it's more like it's in, in your body rather than hearing it around you. Was that your intent? Uh, yeah, I'm really glad that we were able to use headphones for this because <laughs> You know, there's a possibility of just having to, it played aloud and it was just did not have the same effect played aloud. And yeah, like the breathing, obviously it's just me, um, you know, breathing heavily into my microphone and just really got really lightheaded how many times I had to record that loop. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it is really supposed to just reflect some kind of like internal breathing. So yeah. <laughs> that there's, you know, this like omnipresence of just uh, disasters that could, you know, like it's very likely that I'm not gonna be able to grow old uh, like a lot of other people have. And, you know, the world right now is on a trajectory and we're not really doing much at all to stop it. And so I think like, you know, me and my peers have this sort of sense that it's like hey it's it's really possible that none of us will get to like turn 50 um and yeah it's scary sad and i like i guess some people that i know have kind of just accepted it and they have this attitude around the climate uh catastrophe just like well you know we're screwed so whatever and yeah it's it's really hard to think about and they have a really nihilistic view about it a lot of people do and I, I think I end up slipping into that a lot too I try not to be I try and think that hey maybe things will work out if we try really really hard but the fact is is that most of uh you know the climate change is happening is due to big corporations and what can I do <laughs> what you know like what can me as an individual do to stop that so it's really disheartening to see and to um, see my future almost get taken away because i have to you know fight for the climate and stuff the climate crisis is creating everything that could go wrong and i read this book last year no that was earlier this year it's well you know how it is um, it's called uh, The Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells. Is this book that I read and it detailed what exactly is happening, what has happened, what will happen. And it, the, the book started, first line was, it is worse, much worse than you think. That was really great to read. And yeah, so it, it described doomsday or sort of the decline of life 
And it, yeah, it just sort of was like everything that could go wrong will go wrong and it is going wrong. And yeah, that reading that book definitely played a lot into um, this piece because I was working on it as I was reading it. And it just made me think like, oh man, do I really even have like a hope to a, a, a life or something? And I know every single, every single person, every generation has had something going on that they have to like worry about and be like, great, I have to deal with this. So do I get to have dreams? Um, but yeah, that's what I was thinking about a lot when creating my pieces. Do I, do I get to live? <laughs> I'm David Jacob Harder. Uh, I'm from the Caribou in central British Columbia. And um, a great deal of my work and practice focuses a great deal on ecological terms and, and sort of this echo feminism, sort of like some along those those veins. I've, that's what many people have sort of labeled it towards. Um, I myself think of it as more of like this weird romanticism of sorts uh, to where I can travel through time and do all sorts of things, um, which is very playful, but it's very honest. Um, a big part of that is just kind of shedding the layers of sort of my past uh, ego of like, oh, I'm such a warrior and I'm going to take on the world and change everything, but then take an introspective look back into my life and that's what a lot of this plastic journal work was about. Um, even though I considered myself, you, and I still do consider myself a very eco-conscious person and someone who is uh, cognizant of their waste and being waste wise and their daily practices and all such things, I still accrued a, a great deal of debt, like ecological debt, if you will. Um, and so I started looking back at my life and I started uh, when I was in, in uh, undergrad with uh, BFA at uh, Thompson Rivers University where I did a metal journal. And the metal journal was, I essentially, everything that I touched was metal, I would journal. And so then I would equate to how many um, tons of soil needed to be removed or how much soil needed to be removed to create that thing, to create that, whether it was recycled, whether it was this and that. And so then I would then make these small paintings, make these small objects, all based on that metal journal. Then fast forward eight years, um, I guess seven years, I started it last year, the year before, it was probably 2018, 2019, arbitrary. Um, and I started building plastic journal and that was, 
I I was fucking astounded by what was happening in my life. And I was just like, how many things are it was almost easier to reverse my life of like what doesn't have plastic in it? What doesn't have this object? Because I woke up one day and I'm like, I will start making this journal and I will start writing everything down. And by the middle of coffee, it I had already gone to a hundred, 150 things. And so I was starting to think like, okay, so I'm making artwork based on, I basically one day will be the rest of my life. I've got a whole, um, an entire image inventory of everything that I need to make. And so I sort of went through that and I picked, and choose little pieces there here and there continue to journal i journaled for um once a month i would pick a day and i would write the journal of every single thing it became quite tedious and frankly it was boring for that day it was like a boring day um but it was fun and so because when i would go through these lists i would then find out what plastics they were made of and i would find out what their eventual lifespan was and it was kind of my way. And I think this was sort of a looking back on it once I started getting into making the work um, was really, I got to see an optimism of sorts. I don't know, I kind of have that inter inherent optimism. Like I, I have to have both trajectories to sort of balance things out. Um, and, and so it was like my way of traveling into the future because what that, that one day, that I had uh, made essentially, like through my use, now had a lifespan of 150,000 years uh, altogether. I've had some days where say a lighter, say a bottle, say a number five plastic or number seven plastic, they last for 450 years and that's just speculation. And so that speculation leads me to believe that we don't have a fucking clue how long these last so they may be around for 700 years. So I went with the lowest common denominator, sort of like the mean, median mode of the whole situation that I brought it down to the base level, like, hey, the bottom. They say it's gonna be 450, that's what I'll base things off of. So this lasts for 450 years and I did calculations of entire days to where some days I, <laughs> I mean, to be totally honest, I was mortified um, of the whole situation that I now had a day of 300,000 years of existence to where, I mean, it's hard to be optimistic in that sense, <laughs> but at the same time, this is sort of like what I'm leaving behind, things that I touched, whether I'm able to reuse them or not is, again, it's, it's not part of the equation. It's a part of like just being totally brutally honest with myself about what my life impacts the the world in in the future and so it and and inevitably i will die and these things will live on but what their life trajectory is like compared to mine is completely going in the different direction and just knowing that I can kind of share that. People can follow me around in a day-to-day -day life just by reading that short little excerpt of journal, just knowing that, oh, well, he had a shower. I saw a shower bottle here. He brushed his teeth. Oh, here, you know, later on, there might be a corkscrew. And then, you know, and anything, anything, everything, you know, a, a dildo, a fucking condom, you know, the, everything. You, you could know someone's every little moves and I found that really interesting. Um, it, reminded, it reminded me of an exhibition at the Keg, uh, Kara, who did all these in, intimate drawings, these pencil drawings. Kara, uh, Kate, I think you went to school with her. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember her last name. I'm so terrible. Anyhow, she did all these intimate drawings of things in her bedroom that she could see. And it was very much a picture of her bedroom. And this is more of like a picture of actions, activities, you know? So, because everything's sort of inextricably linked with, with the substance. And then when did you decide to cast these items out of concrete? When did phase two come into your process? 
Uh, I think that started um, sort of when I was in casting mode. I was already like casting a few things that I was interested about. And I think in the, in the, in the initial phase, I've kind of saw these as making facsimiles in some way. Like you got to make that copy to show that, but not showing it in the, I, at first I was thinking about the real plastic and I was like, that's so just, you know, boring. You know, I want to, I want to, up the scale or I want to be able to do something different and actually put my hands to work. So I started casting the items first in plaster and I just wasn't satisfied. It's just such a very cliche medium for artists. And I was like, this is too easy. Um, there has to be something in there. You know, Marshall McLuhan says the medium is the message, you know, and you know, that always is rolling around in the back of my head. So I essentially wanted to look at something that was sort of not flexible, not bendable, something that was concrete, <laughs> you know, to be punny as fuck, but that's just ultimately who I am. I, I like to poke fun at things, even though maybe they're sad and weird. Um, there is a situation where I found myself like saying, this is concrete, this has sturdy connotations. This is something that people see as a forever material. When you see a flexible, bendable straw, you don't think of that as, you know, as mighty and strong as, as columns of concrete. So, but to, to, to the fact of the matter is, it actually is much more feeble because it starts breaking down over a hundred years and we don't even know the actual life expectancy of plastic. So I think that's where it started. It was just like sort of that kind of play on materialism. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Siglet. I live in Kamloops. I was born in Kamloops. Uh, I haven't spent my whole life here, um, but a lot of it. Um, I'm really interested in what it means to be an artist in this place and how, how I can convey things about this place in my artwork. Um, I was really pleased to have this subject matter of dust to dust because one of the things that I've always been fascinated by is cemeteries. And it started um, when I had a summer job, when I was uh, cleaning up um, cemeteries up the North Thompson for the, um, at that time, unincorporated town of Barrier. Um, so I, this project has been a really great chance for me to, um, to revisit those places with a different perspective. Um, and it's been really fun to talk to people about cemeteries because um, everybody has a story. Whenever I introduce cemeteries, uh, people always have something to say about their experiences or their reflections. Um, so it's been, it's been really interesting. So it's been, um, I guess with the cemeteries, I, I took a lot of pictures um, and I visited a lot of places and before I started I really had a sense that I had a lot of questions and I'm really grateful to Eddie and Louisa Celesta of SIMP because uh, they talked through a lot of things with me about cemeteries and you know how can you go to a cemetery who, who gets to go to a cemetery who are the cemeteries for um, can you, do you have to ask permission to go to cemeteries, especially some of these very small ones that are, that are a bit remote or, or seem private. Um, so uh, I don't think I really came uh, up with answers to those questions, but um, I really realized in taking the pictures that it wasn't, they weren't intended to be documentary. Um, they weren't, I suppose they're about specific people um, but they're also about the people that make the memorials um, and the people that tend them and, and then further the people who visit them and, and honor them and, and bear witness. 
So um, the photos that are in this exhibit that are behind K that you can see, um, the three that I chose, I, I take them with a full frame camera and I use neutral density filters uh, that allow me to leave the shutter open for about five minutes and still have a, a, an image that's crisp. And I, I really like this process. It's really, um, uh, it's not predictable. Even though you can set it up, you kind of know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to be moving in the photo. You don't know where the light is going to move. Um, and so you end up with a lovely image that has some pieces that are soft, like the leaves and or people. People can move through and be soft. In one of the images, there are four of us standing and you can just barely see that, that we're there. Um, but also some things are very, very crisp like the concrete of the headstones in some cases or stones and headstones and they they give a really nice contrast um, and they they also give you a sense of thinking about transitions and the passage of time so i thought that they were really a nice way to consider uh, memorials and passage of time and transition and and remembrance um, so I found that visiting the cemeteries some 30 years after I was first there, I found that instead of the names just being family names that I know, it started to be about friends and family that I know. And so it really feels good to remember and it gives me um, a, a, a sense of gratitude for the memorials. So when I go ahead with this body of work, I'm really I really want to continue it and I, I really want to think about connecting the people who exist in these communities now who have people, families in those cemeteries and to think about how, who those cemeteries are for um, and, and how, how they serve the communities where they exist. So I think there's a great potential to, to connect people now to the people that are in the cemeteries. It's just, there's so many things to think about. Photography has always had um, the connection to death. There's the, there's the sense that once you take a photograph, you can never go back to that. That, that point in time is, is gone. So it's something that's always a memorial. There's always a sense of nostalgia that's, that's linked to, to photographs. Um, but there's also a sense that you can uh, manipulate things with photos, particularly with digital photos. Like I think everybody is pretty comfortable with the idea that you can Photoshop anything to, to make it change. And, and it is not an example of um, truth, I suppose. Um, but, it's a, but it's a way of giving witness. It's a way of, of um, having a memorial of some form. But I, but I think it's also very much an artist's um, medium because you can uh, convey uh, what you want to in a photograph. Uh, so you can um, get across something that you, you want to. And I think particularly with cemeteries, it gives you that sense of, of nostalgia of memorializing things, um, but also being able to tell a story.